Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 745 of the Juicebox Podcast. You will never know just how close this episode came to being called Yukon Ass Shaker. On today's program, I'll be speaking with Margaret. She has type 1 diabetes, and uh, that's pretty much what you need to know. I don't even know why I bothered doing this at the beginning. Just listen to the episode. It's great. Trust me. While you're trusting me, please remember that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. See, I'm still, it's not too late for me to change the name. But I don't know how to put that. I don't know if I can put ass in the title or if Apple will kick it out. Ah, damn it. The second title's great too, but you can't ass shaker. You have no idea. All right. It's probably called Noki at Midnight, but in my heart, you know what I mean? Oh, uh, t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. Fill out the survey. Thanks. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by the Dexcom G6 Continuous Glucose Monitor. Learn more at Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. And while you're there, see if you're eligible for a free 10-day trial of the Dexcom G6. Speaking of free trials, you may be eligible for a free trial of the Omnipod Dash, a 30-day trial, actually. Go check it out at Omnipod.com forward slash juice box. Not looking for the Omnipod Dash? You want something a little more automatic, like the Omnipod 5? That's at the link as well, omnipod.com forward slash juice box. Hey, I'm Margaret. I am a musical theater performer and actor. I live in Canada, and I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes uh, three years ago at the age of 27. There are fine arts in Canada. Yeah, there, you know, it's not like it's Broadway, but yes, there are fine arts in Canada. You know, I said that because there's one person I have in mind that will be bothered by that statement. And I said it just for them. So I, I, I imagine there are fine arts in Canada. Um, how, how old are you? Uh, 30. How old were you when you're diagnosed? 27. Oh, recently. Yes. Yes, it is recently. It is. And I don't get many of these. Um, your age is like... I don't get many diagnosed late twenties still kind of in it. Oh, this will be fun. Good. And I think you all should be questioning yourself about a podcast where the host says this will be fun after a person says they were given an incurable disease three years ago. <laughs> I'm like, oh great, this will be fun. Um so how did you well wait, no, no, what am I gonna ask you? Is there any um are there any other autoimmune issues in your family? It's so funny because I um Thought the answer was no. When I like when I was first diagnosed, they're like, "Do you have anyone else who has diabetes?" And I was like, "No, no, this is very weird." And um, but my grandfather had celiac disease, but he was diagnosed at like seventy five, mm -hmm. um, and was really, really bitter about it the whole time. So he's the only one with autoimmune diseases. Okay, hold on a second. Your seventy five year old grandfather is diagnosed with celiac, and it pissed him off. Oh, he was furious. And like my, my mom is really, they have a, have, they had a funny relationship. Like he really liked to get kind of be like, this isn't good enough. And she really wanted to make things nice for him. So she would try and make all these like family desserts without any gluten. And he would be like, ah, oh, where's the other, like, where's the other dessert that's impossible to make without gluten. So it was like kind of a, I think it was mostly a joke. Like, I think he thought it was funny to be like, ah. Oh. I hate celiac disease, but yeah, it really pissed him off. But make me bread that tastes like bread, damn it. Do it now. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can't but wait to be. he made his own bread. Like, he was, he was, he like figured it out. But yeah, he was, he would get mad. Yeah. He'd go to Italian. He'd be like, what's the, like, what's the point of this? Do you think I'm the only one excited to get old so that I can be like that? Oh, I think it'll be awesome. Like, he was so cool. We yeah. went on a family trip and he, um, we went, like, we went to Greece and we went up the Acropolis and we were, he was like kind of walking around and we asked him what his favorite part was. And he was like, 
walking through other people's pictures and ruining them. <laughs> and he was so like, he was like it's old, sincere. he was almost 90. So everyone was just like, oh, this man is tottering around and he's no, he's walking through their pictures on purpose to ruin the pictures. It's the nicest story I've ever heard in my life. That's wonderful. <laughs> Excellent. So you realize that that's an autoimmune issue. You have one now, but you were saying when the doctor asked you, I don't know anybody else has diabetes in my family. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what led you to go to a doctor? Yeah, it was kind of like, it's a little bit of a two-parter story. Like I went to the doctor when I got diagnosed for like a physical, like I went to get a pap smear and, um, and, but I was having, I had been having like long distance vision stuff and I had gone to the doctor and they were like, or the eye doctor and they're like, you're watching too much TV. It's fine. And I was like, yep, that checks out. Great. I'm watching too much TV. And, um, and then I went to my family doctor who's really awesome. And he was like, that seems weird. Let's just like, you know, let's just do some blood work just for kicks. Let's, let's do it. Let's see if there's anything going on. And then he called me the next day and was like, hey, um, the lab technician called me in the middle of the night. Your blood sugar is 38. And I was like, I, and I looked it up for conversion purposes. So it's like 684. Mm-hmm. And he was like, do you have any symptoms of diabetes? And I was like, I don't think so. And I can't like, watch okay, television go. anymore. Is that one? Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> no, it seems <laughs> weird. Um, and he was like, well, you know, go and get your blood sugar tested again. Um, it might've just been a fluke, get your A1C tested and and we'll see. And, um, and then I, and I was, he kind of told me what the symptoms were. And then I thought about it and was like, you know, yeah, like I have been drinking a lot of water, but there's a radiator right next to my bed and my, it makes my house really hot and dry. So it's just really hot and dry. And I have been peeing a lot, but you know, I've been drinking a lot of water. So I've been peeing a lot. Um, And I also like hadn't been feeling great, but I had a really, um, just a really not great year the year before leading up to diabetes. Like I had a friend pass away and a really bad apartment fire and I was working out of town while these things were happening. So I just like didn't have a ton of time to process any of that. So it just kind of left me with like a lingering in the background, not feeling great. So I was just like, yeah, I'm not feeling great, but like this year was really terrible. So anyway, but I called the doctor back and was like, I have been having some symptoms. And he was like, you know, maybe just like go to the hospital and see if they'll give you insulin and then you can just leave. And I was like, okay, that seems like a reasonable plan. And whoa, whoa, then I was hold on, hold on, like, Margaret, slow days. down, slow down. With hindsight, you look back on that and you're like, what? Am I right? Like maybe a little bit. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Right. And you're talking to a real doctor, right? Not like, and I, I don't mean to be ham fisted about this, but like a polar bear with a phone or something like that. Like you're in Canada. I, I don't know what part are you. No, in? he's a great doctor. He was a, like, mm-hmm. has been a, a lovely doctor throughout the years. Mm-hmm. Um, But yeah, retrospectively, I'm like, that's <laughs> not been good, not very good advice. Margaret, are you telling um, me that back before you were sick, he was a great doctor. And then when you needed actual help, he got shaky. No, I don't even think that it was that. I think he just thought it was so weird because it was such a high blood sugar to be not having really intense symptoms Mm -hmm. that I think he was like, he didn't, I don't think he thought that that was really what was going on. Like, I think there was still a part of his mind that was like, you're, we're going to test you again and that's going to be a mistake and you won't have diabetes. You are, by the way, are so lovely and Canadian. It's, we've only been talking for eight minutes. If I tried for the next hour and a half, you would not say anything bad about that person. That's amazing. <laughs> you, it, it's just, it's like you're Midwestern, but without that accent, were you? Because why are you not owing and eyeing? What part of Canada are you in? Ish. Um, Toronto. Oh. I'm sure I will. I'll give you. I'll give you an A. I'm sure. Um, because I say A all the time. You put the R in Toronto, so I was pretty uplifted by that. Well, I'm glad. Yeah. I'm glad to give service this morning. <laughs> but you know how it's T O R. But yes. a lot of you want to say T-R, like Anto. Yes, Tronto. Toronto, yeah, yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, don't worry. I mispronounce yeah. every word. And here I am, like, I'm aware of it when other people do it. But when I do it, I'm like, I don't hear it. Water. <laughs> it's hilarious. Anyway, yeah. uh, so, okay. So, well-meaning doctor sends you to the to the, to the the hospital. You get there and... Yeah, um, I got there. I sat in the emergency. And he also, again, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm like, this was weird advice. Um, 
But he was like, just don't any eat any foods that are high on the GI index. And I was like, okay. So um, my roommate came with me and we brought a bunch of like almonds and apples. And it was just sort of depressing. Like we were just, there was like a vending machine and we couldn't eat any chips. I was like, this sucks. And then. Um, oh, wait, I have waited. a question. You know the glycemic index before you had diabetes? No, I Googled it and was like, um, <laughs> I think this is right. Like, I don't really the know. The Canadian internet had all that information? I mean, yes. I mean, it's the same internet, I think. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's not. Maybe Margaret, it's not. I've only ever used Canadian internet. Oh, Margaret, this is going to be so much fun. You're not hearing my sarcasm either. We're going to have such a good time. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> okay. So, so you're... <laughs> Oh my gosh. Um, so you're at the hospital eating your bird food and what happens? Yeah. Sorry. Um, and then I get my blood sugar tested again. And there was a lot of like, I think they were confused because I'm an adult, um, obviously. And, but I'm like quite tall and quite thin. So, you know, stereotypically I don't present as somebody with type two, mm -hmm. but then when they tested my blood sugar, it had come down to about a 15. Um, so they were like, you don't need to be here at first. Like you, that's a totally reasonable number for someone with diabetes. And I was like, no, I don't have diabetes. And they were like, oh, but <laughs> you have diabetes. Um, and then they admitted me, I think just to kind of like get my blood sugar lower and did some sort of like brought you sort of pamphlets and stuff to explain what's going on. And, I think the reason I was in there for five days was that they couldn't figure out what my doses were. I think their expectation was they would give me insulin and it would go way down, but that just, it just sort of didn't stabilize for a while. Um, yeah, it was weird. I had some people who were very, very lovely. Um, and you kind of had a variety of doctors throughout the time. And some of them were so lovely and were kind of like you, this isn't going to change your life. You're going to be totally fine. Like this is just going to be something you have to manage. And then I had a couple other people like this one man came in and I was only eating the hospital food. And he was like, you really got to bring your blood sugar down. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, how, how would you suggest I go about doing that? And he was like, well, stop eating so much pizza and ice cream. And I was like, I've only eaten your sandwiches. And then obviously I started to cry and he got so uncomfortable and was just like, oh, I didn't mean, I didn't. Uh, uh. Um, but yeah, it was, it was like a mixed, it was a mixed bag for sure. Um, he was a hospital employee? He was a nurse. Yeah. Oh, and he just led with stop eating pizza and ice cream, Were you, but you weren't eating pizza and ice cream? No. And annoyingly leading up like the month before I was diagnosed, I was doing, um, my friend and I decided we were going to do like a really healthy month and like cut out all sorts of sugar and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I had been eating like not good food, like, like salads all month. And so I was so mad because I was like, I haven't, I haven't eaten any treats <laughs> in a really long time. This is so annoying. <laughs> Plus you don't understand sarcasm and you're lovely. So people should not be picking on you. You know what I mean? Yes. I mean, also it was kind of awesome. Like I, I wrote a note down in my phone of all the crazy things people said. Cause it just, I also had, it was just so funny. Like it was like, the, you're saying like I had one nurse who just said some wild things. Like she, what did she say? She, at one point she was like, I dated someone with diabetes and they had a heart attack at 45. And I was like, why are you telling me this? Like, this is so <laughs> crazy. <laughs> hey, um, you're not doing much for the Canadian healthcare system. Arguably. Yeah, I guess right not. Eh? Yeah, 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 I was yeah, like, yeah. that experience was great. And I'm thinking about it. I'm like, that was that Wait, did great. this happen right there in Toronto? <laughs> yep, in Toronto. Oh, I see. Okay, so not up in the hinterland or anything like that. No. No, you weren't in. Let me let me test my knowledge. Um, the Yukon, that's a place in, in Canada, right? No. It's um, it, it, sorry, it, I was not in the Yukon. Okay. It, um, it was not in the Yukon, but actually, um, I brief, I have lived there. I worked there. I was a can, can dancer there for five months. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. Everyone slow down. <laughs> First of all, we just skipped over the fact that I think I was right that the Yukon's in Canada. All right. Yeah. So, sorry, the Yukon is in Canada. Right, I want some credit for that. And then the second thing is 
can can like kick dancing like on stage. Yeah, like like jump and kick and toss your skirt around. In a bar? Uh in a casino, which isn't better. Isn't better. <laughs> <laughs> there's right. So there's a casino in the Yukon. Yeah, it's actually the oldest casino definitely in Canada, I think maybe in North America. Definitely in Canada. How do you get the whale blubber into the slot on the slot machine to play? Um, you have to push it really hard and it makes a big mess. <laughs> so, okay. So when you were younger, I'm guessing. Yes. You you went to the Yukon and, sh- I mean, we can just say shook your ass, right? Like for, for people. At a basically, yeah, yeah. Basically, yeah, yeah. yes. And how long did you do that for? Uh, five months. Can I be honest with you? I wish that. My ass was such that someone would be interested enough to look at it <laughs> if it was shaking. Um, but I have a very, very flat butt. So I don't think this is going to happen. You know, when you look I mean, at my, it, I'm it was sorry. like, I don't know. I was, I don't know. Like, was my butt particularly? No, it was also on the flat side, realistically, at the time. All right. You yeah. also said you were tall. Now I'm challenging you. How tall were you? Are you? Five, uh, five foot nine. Oh, you're tall. Good for you. Yeah. Yeah, height's nice. Thank you. All right. Um, you said thank you. You're like, yes, I am tall. Thank you. I am indeed. And I did it all myself. <laughs> By myself. I made it happen. From a young yep. age, I decided I was <laughs> going to be tall. <laughs> and I worked hard at it. Um, okay. What did you go to? Did you go to college? Yeah. For what? A musical theater. Okay. And interesting. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so now you have diabetes. We've gotten through the... The sketchy medical advice, which you you won't call sketchy medical advice, but any doctor who's like, I'm not sure if you have diabetes, but go to the hospital. Maybe they'll give your insulin. Trust me, that's dodgy advice. And so, um, and you get there, they do the testing. I imagine they say, congratulations, you have diabetes. You meet mean nurses um, who are probably well-meaning, but not great at communicating. What yes. what state of mind do you leave the hospital in? Um, honestly, like I. I have a a friend who has type one and we were friends before I was diagnosed and he's also in musical theater. Um, and we had worked together and we were the kind of friends where like we got along really well, but we weren't super close. So I didn't, I knew he had type one and I knew he was, didn't, it didn't really affect his life as he presented himself other than he talked about it. Um, So, and he had an Omnipod. And so in my mind, I was like, oh my God, this is like, this is, he's, this is not a big deal at first. Um, Because I, like when I was first in the hospital and because I was like, oh, I'll just get an Omnipod, I'll stick it on my arm. And then like, this will be awesome. And, um, and then they started explaining carb counting and everything to me. And I was like, what? Like, he's been doing this this whole time. This oh, is I insane. See. Like, this is so much work. Got you. Um, but that was really helpful because I had somebody who was, um, I, I knew, and they just did everything that I wanted to do. Um, and also, this is a bit weird, um, but I've been, I've like somebody who, kind of my whole life has been a hypochondriac and not in like a cute fun way like in a you're really convinced you're dying and it kind of ruins your life oh margaret hold on what would periods a, of time what would a cute fun way be <laughs> i don't know like a woody allen way where he's like oh i'm so nervous about my, this thing like i i think i have a stomach ache or whatever like i, it, I got you you're, you're, you know what i mean like a charming way Yeah, you're on the floor like this is it it's over yeah like 100 yeah. percent. i'm convinced i'm dying mm-hmm. and Um, and so I had, and I've also like had a very nice life. Like my parent, I, up until that point, I, things had gone pretty well. Um, and I think the combination of those things kind of made me have this sense in the back of my mind that was like, well, something horrible is going to happen at some point. Like this just can't, this is, something's going to happen. And probably I'm going to be diagnosed with cancer and I'm going to die. Um, and so it had just never crossed my mind that I could be diagnosed with something and it could be manageable. You know what I mean? Like it would just, you'd get something and it would be, you just deal with it. Right. And so I think my initial reaction was kind of like, Oh my God, like this is, I'm not, I just, I just have to give myself needles. And like, this is so manageable. This is not, Mm -hmm. this is fine. Like this is 
best case scenario in terms of being diagnosed with something. You and I have uh, more in common than I thought at first. So um, I I used to set these uh, arbitrary, like, I don't know, um, ages in my head. Like, you know what I mean? Like, uh, if I make it to 21 without this happening, that'll probably never happen. If I get yeah. to 30 without getting, you know, something, well, that'll probably never happen. Like, I... I don't know why, and it wasn't. It's not like a real prevalent in the front of my mind kind of way of thinking. Um, it's not obsessive or anything weird like that. But it is like I have like talked myself into believing based on what I see around me. Like you know, my friends in their forties, you know, uh, who were going to have heart attacks had them. You know, by the time they were like this age. So if I make it this far, that probably is good news for my heart. Mm-hmm. You have a lot of that in your head, huh? Like yeah, yeah, totally. and so. But you had the wherewithal to say, this has all been going too easy. Something's got to happen. Yes, 100%. That's really interesting. By the way, I agree with you. I don't think anybody gets through this unscathed, you, you know? Yeah. I mean, the thing is, it like, it did happen, right? But right. this is, I, I still kind of, I'm like, well, this is, in, in terms of the things that could happen to you, this really isn't the worst one. That's for sure. No, no, I, I agree with you. I really do. Um what, how do you make a living? Like, what do you do day to day? That's a great question. Um, before the pandemic, I was a musical theater um, actor and performer. Um, so I would, um, I have a dance background, like I did competitive dance growing up. So I would do musicals basically to make money. Um, and then uh, once the pandemic hit, um, all my contracts obviously got canceled because you can't gather with people. Uh, so since then I've been doing a little bit of like film and TV stuff and then working, I worked at a bakery for a while. Um, and then now I'm working at a barbecue restaurant and an antique store. Oh, okay. Do you think you'll get back to the performing thing? Yeah, that's the plan. It's starting to open up a bit. Um, and hopefully once, we just don't, you know, oh, sorry, that's my blood sugar. Oh. Hey, girl. Um, Is that low? That's high. High? What yeah. Are you, what are you calling high? Uh, 8.9. So, like, one, 160. 160? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you know how I figured that out so quickly, Margaret? Do you have a, a converter on the Juicebox Podcast website? I do. It's at juiceboxpodcast.com forward slash conversion. <laughs> Margaret, good job. Thank you very much. <laughs> very nice. I'm considering calling this episode Yukon Ass Shaker. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, that would be – I would sound way cooler than I am, so that would be sick. <laughs> I don't I think tell I can, everyone. I don't think I can use the word ass in the title. I'm going to have to go with butt. <laughs> um, and you're a former. Wouldn't it be funny if it was Yukon butt shaker and then in parentheses, former after former? It's like, well, not as good, but close. <laughs> well, listen, that bakery closes down and <laughs> you might, I, I mean, I got to go back. You might be I up there again. My- yeah. You understand that in my mind, you were dancing for like um, gold miners, right? You're going to be thrilled because that was sometimes the case. Really? Yeah. I am thrilled. How did you know I'd be thrilled? That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was like it was there was kind of a tourist season. So sometimes it would be older people who went on cruises. And then sometimes it would be sort of forest fighters, forest firefighters and miners, which was it was a weird contrast for sure. Um, but yeah, please tell me that at least once in your life, a toothless man with a scraggly beard threw a nugget of gold at you and said, shake that thing, honey. Oh, I wish it was that. <laughs> it was mostly just. People not quite like that intensely rugged looking, but they didn't have gold nuggets. They just they had like casino chips, but we did get casino chips thrown at the stage. All right, that's the meaning. But I I'm sorry. <laughs> I realized as I said it, I was like, oh, that's a hard. If you, were, I, but you were probably like, throw the chip. Like you need the chips, right? You're like, come on. I mean, it was a little weird. Yeah. Not weird, but like. <laughs> I mean, yes. The answer is yes. We didn't get to keep them, so that was annoying. They had to go in like a pot for everybody. Um, but it was a little bit strange. Like I, it, 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 it did kind of. You felt like you were a, a stripper, and I was like, "This is interesting." Like I didn't intend to be a stripper, and now I get to kind of see what this feels like, and mm-hmm. do I like it or not? 
And um, what was the answer to that question, Margaret? I think it was no. Okay. Um, I think sometimes it was val- validating. Sometimes I was like, yeah, I, I am so hot that you're throwing your <laughs> chips at me. Um, and then other times I was like, this feels a little, I don't feel, I feel kind of degraded. Uh, it's possible my experience. grandfather would not be okay with this. Yeah, he would be like, yeah. I don't know what he would say. Well, he'd just walk in in between the dancing and the chipping and just wander around like he was lost, I would imagine. Yeah, get in people's photographs, be like, where is the gluten-free bread? <laughs> That's it. By the way, I find all this very interesting. I hope other people do, too. Um, <laughs> okay, so it wasn't as easy as putting an Omnipod on your arm, but did you get an insulin pump? Um, I don't have an insulin pump yet, no. Okay, so what? how's management been going for you? Are you wearing a CGM? Yeah. Obviously, you are. We heard it beeping. Uh, yes. And it's beeping, so you're using Dexcom? I'm not using Dexcom. Uh, the I don't have um, private insurance, so I do my insurance through the – there's like a Canadian government program that lets you get prescriptions, and okay. right now they cover the Libre sensors, but they don't cover the Dexcom, which is very annoying. Um, so I've bought one of the, um, like a meow meow, like, uh, oh. thing that you stick on top of your Libre and, uh, turned it into a CGM. Gotcha. So you have Libre and then there's this like third party thing you kind of put on it that gives you more access to re- yeah. real time stuff. Yeah. It gives you alerts and alarms basically. Not, and, and it, the, the graph company, style but... is kind of the same in the Dex as the Dexcom, like it's little dots. Okay. Whereas the Libre is just an arrow and, and that I, I, the dots are, it's so helpful. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's a, it's um I'm right to say it's a third party thing though, right? It's like from yeah. a, a private company. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and you're doing that with MDI. So yeah. how's that going? Like where's your where's your care at? Are you trying to make adjustments or are you good with yourself? Like where are you at? The Omnipod 5 automated insulin delivery system is available now and waiting for you at Omnipod.com forward slash juice box. Omnipod 5 is the only tubeless automated insulin delivery system that integrates with the Dexcom G6 CGM, and it uses smart adjust technology to automatically adjust your insulin delivery every five minutes, helping to protect against highs and lows without multiple daily injections. Omnipod 5 is also available through your pharmacy, which means you can get started without the four-year durable medical equipment contract that comes with most insulin pumps, even when you're currently in warranty with another system. To get started today, go to omnipod.com forward slash juice box. Now, for those of you who aren't in the market for an automated system, but still want an insulin pump and love the idea of tubeless, you're looking for the Omnipod Dash. Head over to my link, omnipod.com forward slash juice box. While you're there, You'll be able to learn everything you need to know about the Omnipod 5 and the Omnipod Dash. And you can also find out if you're eligible for a free 30-day trial of the Omnipod Dash. My daughter Arden has been wearing the Omnipod since she was 4 years old, and she just turned 18. That is 14 years of wearing an Omnipod every day, and it has been nothing but a friend in this journey with insulin. Because the Omnipod is tubeless, you can wear it while you're showering, swimming, or participating in your favorite physical activity. It's a big deal to not have to disconnect from a tubed pump to do those things. Head over now to omnipod.com forward slash juice box to find out if you're eligible for that free 30-day trial of the Dash, to learn more about the Dash, or to learn more about the Omnipod 5. Get started today. Omnipod 5 full safety and risk information as well as a list of compatible phones and clinical trial claims data are available at my link. And at that same link, omnipod.com forward slash juice box, you can also find terms and conditions for that Omnipod Dash 30-day trial. How would you like to know what your blood sugar is without poking a hole in your finger? You can with the Dexcom G6 Continuous Glucose Monitoring System, which is available at dexcom.com forward slash juice box. Not only does Dexcom offer zero finger sticks, but you can get your glucose readings right on your smart device. That's your iPhone or your Android. Don't have a phone? That's okay. You can use Dexcom's receiver. On any of these devices, you're able to set up customizable alerts and alarms 
setting your optimal range so that you'll get notified when your glucose levels go too high or too low. And you can share this data with up to 10 followers. Imagine what that could look like. Your child could be at school and their data could be available to you, your spouse, their aunt, the school nurse, anyone who you choose. My daughter's been wearing a Dexcom forever and it helps us in multiple ways. Around meals, we're able to see if our boluses are well-timed and well-measured. If they aren't, we can tell by how her blood sugar reacts and then go back the next time and make an adjustment. Without the Dexcom CGM, we're sort of flying blind, but not just at meals, also during activity and sleep. The Dexcom offers us an unprecedented level of comfort and security. Being able to see my daughter's blood sugars in real time, and not just the number, but the speed and direction, is an absolute game changer if you're using insulin. Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. Head over there today to see if you're eligible for a free 10-day trial of the Dexcom G6. The Dexcom is at the center of how we've been able to keep our daughter's A1C between 5'2 and 6'2 for over seven years. We've been able to minimize variability and keep her blood sugars in a stable range because of the information that we can see with the Dexcom. These are our results and yours may vary, but using Dexcom's feedback has helped my daughter, without any food restrictions, live a more normal and healthy life. Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. Um, I would say I'm pretty, I'm happy with my, I don't know. I would say like, I'm solidly intermediate level. I, I want to get a pump. Um, I honeymooned, I I'm pretty sure for about two years. Um, so there, I didn't have a lot of the background fluctuations that I have now just with like period hormones and mm-hmm. fat and protein rises. Like that just didn't come into play. So it was, it was. I was low more than I wanted to be, but it was p- pretty chill. Like I had an A1C in the, in the fives consistently. Um, but now that that's ended, it's just, a it's my last A1C was six. So I'm happy with that, but it's more work than I think it needs to be. I see. So are you listening? Have you been listening to the podcast for long? Yeah. Yeah. I do listen. And so you're bumping and nudging and you're too involved. You're saying. Yeah. It's just, I feel like I'm having to adjust a lot and, and I end up playing catch up a lot because I want to be able to, um, just, I find that I'm more insulin resistant. It's sort of when I'm ovulating and then more insulin sensitive by kind of a lot when I'm on my period and, but I haven't tracked it. So I don't have like a precise knowledge of when that starts and when it ends. So I'm, I'll, I'll give myself my Lantus and then that period will kick in and I'll be like, oh no, I need more. But then there's a moment where you're like, maybe it's just today because I'm, I'm going to wait. And then you're spending sort of two, three days playing catch up. Yeah. And then it, by the time you've got it kind of right and you're like, yeah, now I can be more aggressive. Then it switches into more sensitive time. And then you're low all day and you're like, well, I don't want to do that again. And so it just, it's just, I feel like it's more work than it needs to be. A number of um, period tracking apps allow you to make notes day to day where you could just easily write like, you know, sensitive or, you know, resistant or whatever words you decide to use um, or take little notes about how meals went. I bet you in a month. I mean, I bet if you did it for two months, you you'd have something you could start comparing and maybe you could start seeing some similarities to distances of time between, you know, ovulation the event and other things like that. Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. possible. I mean, it's worth an effort. I mean, you're yeah, totally. Yeah. You're just, is Canada ever going to open back up or is it? Um, <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I think so. I'm hopeful soon that we're going to start going back to somewhat normal. Yeah. Cause I went to a play like two months ago, just so you know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very wild. I have a couple of friends who live in the States. And I'm like, what? This is just a, it's like an alternate reality or something. Like, I don't, I don't know. It's very strange. Um, I, I believe I, oh, yeah, I learned yesterday can. that a number of like Northeast States are dropping mask mandates for kids at school in the next four weeks. And um, 
I mean, like I said, I had to wear a mask, but I, I mean, I saw To Kill a Mockingbird on Broadway and it was a packed house and, you know, I, I, assume, yeah. I assume you'll get back to it eventually. Yeah, I think so. It's a, I think part of the, the trick, this is maybe boring, but I think part of the trick up here is just, um, we don't have the money. Like the Canadian theater scene is, is just operates on pretty tight. I mean, theater always kind of operates on a tight margin, but we operate on a very tight margin. And so you can't, if you want to do a musical with 25 people, that's a lot of people to pay. And you kind of need to guarantee that you can have a bunch of people in the audience. Yeah. And because we we're just more intense about um, keeping things a little bit more locked down and things have kind of opened up and shut back down. I think they're just nervous about doing anything like that. Yeah. So you get the production up on its feet and then something happens and now you owe people money and you don't have any ticket sales. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, I saw, I mean, Jeff Daniels was in mine, so there was, uh, there was some costs to, to <laughs> seeing the affair. I got those tickets as a Christmas gift. Um, oh, that's a nice gift. Yeah. And, and, um, uh, I, I, I knew I was, I was going to get, I, was, I knew I was going to be in a good seat because when my wife handed them to me, she's like, just don't check into how much they cost. And I was like, okay. <laughs> she's like, just, let's just go to the play and have a good time. And we saw his last performance, which was really, uh, oh, that's so cool. Which was really lovely and, and nice. It was a great, it was a great play. Um, it's a great play for all of you who can't see it now because the actor's no longer in it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, all right. Well, are you, um, do you date? Do you have anybody in your life or do you live with a roommate, anything like that? Um, I live by myself. I do date, um, but I don't have a partner. Gotcha. Um, how is dating with diabetes? Oh, it's hard. Um, mostly because like the, the diabetes itself is fine. Like the, um, the telling people is totally fine, Mm -hmm. but I always get, um, adrenaline before the date and I keep making plans to have like nice foods. And then I don't, I have my blood sugar goes high and I don't want to bolus for it because I don't want to go low. Like it's just it, I, it's, it's like a moment when I'm like, oh man, like this is really, it, it, it interrupts the enjoyment of a date sometimes so, for sure. So like on a first date, you feel like, let me see if I'm following this correctly. You get anxious because it's a first date and you're going to tell somebody, do you tell them right away you have diabetes? Oh yeah. Okay. And you're going to tell somebody you have diabetes right away. And is there a thought in your head? Like maybe I'll get rejected because of this. I mean, if they rejected me, I'd be like, Great, you know, because weeds them out faster. Yeah, weeds them out faster for yeah. sure. And also, it's like, well, I have diabetes, so if you re- if you don't want to date someone with diabetes, then you don't want to date me because it's not like oh, I can pretend that I don't have it while right. we date. Right. So okay, so that's in your head. Your blood sugar kind of jumps up, but then you think, if I bolus, I don't also don't want to get low in front of this person. Yes. Ah, do you have a lot of anxiety around that? Around getting low. Um, sometimes I really feel my lows, which is great. Um, but I don't like being low in front of people because it just feels really vulnerable. And also like you're in an altered state and I, you can kind of like see somebody, especially people who I, I know, like I have, you know, people that I know well, but and that are really close to me, but I haven't spent that much time with them since being diagnosed. So they've never seen me low before. And it's, it's, it is a weird, like they just kind of like, they look at you weird and are, and it like, cause you can, and you don't really know that you're talking in a high pitched voice or behaving strangely, but you are, and they're kind of looking at you strangely and it just feels really vulnerable. And, and I don't, it's not great. Yeah. Plus your perception is probably off too. So it's probably yes. intensified, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, that's interesting. That's not something that people talk about very often. Um, so in order to not feel like that or to be like that around other people, you may make decisions about your care that you wouldn't normally make. Yeah, totally. But th- but when you normally bolus for ang- like for like stressful situation, do you get low afterwards or is it just a fear? Um, I will get low afterwards. If it's, if it's a, if it's adrenaline, mm-hmm. um, I also often get like, 
you know, I'll get adrenaline around doing an audition or doing a show sometimes, but I don't want to bolus for that because usually those environments are like cardio environments. So it will bring it back down. Right. Um, but then a date, obviously. So then I, it's a little hard to tell because it'll, it, it sometimes will go low, but that's because of the cardio. Whereas a date is different. Like, I, I guess actually I don't, I haven't really thought about this. I don't usually go low in a date. Mm-hmm. It would just Because be the high. adrenaline's there the whole time. Yeah. So we're learning it is exciting to date. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I want to take it away from diabetes for a second. Like, it's such a great... um barometer for stuff that normal people that normal people that's not what i meant people normally go through that you don't get to see because they don't have access to their blood sugars and other internal workings but you actually yeah. you actually get to see your excitement or your nervousness yeah. yeah yeah it's interesting it's it's really interesting actually like if you detach it from from the um the frustrating and parts of it that are hard it is very interesting like i am every time I don't get enough sleep, I'm like, Oh my God, you need a lot of sleep. Like, this is just so interesting how much harder it is to manage when I haven't. It's, it's, yeah, it's like, that's just happening in everyone's body all the time. They have no idea. Yeah. It's very interesting. How how important sleep is. Also, I imagine you will be able to tell if you don't like a date, right? Because if your blood sugar doesn't go up, you're probably sitting there thinking like, Oh, this isn't too exciting. Yeah. I don't care that much. Apparently. So, Margaret, just for clarity, because you're older and if your parents hear this, they hear this. Are you basically sitting there thinking like, I'm never going to have sex with this guy. So it's not exciting. How quickly um, do women judge that? That's my real question. Upon That's me. a great question. Um, I don't necessarily think I'm a great example because I am. Um, I like very much need some sort of. Emo- I mean, maybe I am exactly the right example, but I need some sort of like emotional connection before I really want to have sex with somebody in that way where you're like, yeah. Um, but uh, I don't know. I I feel like there's like two parts of it. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like there's like two parts of it when you're on a date, right? There's like the is, how attractive is this person? How attractive do I find this person? And then there's the like, what's their personality like? And those barometers can kind of go up and down and change how interested you are in the person. See, now that there's where sometimes men will like if men meet like women they find attractive, and then the woman says nothing for an hour. Guys can pretty much ignore that, but you can't ignore that. Like, so a, no. a handsome boy who, um, I'm sorry, we never like really hammered through that, but boys, a uh, boys and girls. Okay. Okay. So a handsome person. Um, and then, then you look at, and you're like, oh God, they're totally boring. And then it doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, it'll be fine. <laughs> it'll, I'll be, I'll be fine with it for like two or three dates and then it will just become too obvious. And I'm like, no, okay. I'm sorry. This, this isn't going to happen. Gotcha. It takes a couple of dates. That's it. So you don't have like a, you don't walk into a room ever and be like, oh, there's a wasted night. <laughs> you don't like it. I mean, sometimes. Really? Okay. Yeah. I've, yeah. There have been some dates that I've been like, oh, no, that was. Gotcha. But yeah. usually at least they're funny. So that's worth something. Do you tell them or do you just like, how does, how do you stop? Like, cause you're at a really interesting age. Like you're, you're, you know. It, it, you're not young and you're not old. It, yes, 100%. What, right, which is just, it's a really interesting age. So you don't, you're not looking to waste time, but you have some time to waste. So you meet a person, you like them, like as a person, but you're not interested in them as a partner. And how do you like, like, is there something you do to make that clear? Or do you just let it kind of drift away? Or how does that work? Um, Depends on the person. I'll usually pretty be pretty clear um, if it, yeah. If I know that it's not going to go anywhere, I'll usually send them a, a text message just along the lines of like, hey, thank you so much. I think we'd be, be better off friends, but no thank you. And then um, we just generally don't actually stay friends. <laughs> yeah, I don't see why you would. Like, <laughs> yeah. It, it's, not, it's not called Friend Finder that you're on. I imagine. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> they have all this technology in Canada, too. It's amazing. You know, we like, do. like internet and like applications for your phones, stuff. Like oh, that. yeah. We have so many applications <laughs> that we can use. Yes. Various dating apps. So many applications that you can use. Various <laughs> dating apps. Um, 
I, I am having a good time talking to you. I don't know if we've talked about anything yet, but. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm like, what are we talking about? I don't know. You were talking about everything you say that I find interesting. Um, <laughs> more boys or girls or does it not matter? Um, lately, it's been more girls. But that's more because for a while it was only boys. So I'm like, I want to date all the girls because that's interesting to me. So you're balancing it out. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, do you think about having kids? I do. I uh, this is I don't I really don't know. And and 30 is a bit old to still be like, I really don't know. Um, so, yeah, that's that's the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but I really don't know. But I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah no. so you're not sure. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. Would it matter? I, I guess it wouldn't matter, right? Like it wouldn't matter if you, like, what if you got really serious with a boy versus a girl, or a girl versus a boy? Like, it, it's just the way you would have a baby would change. But it's not like the desire. Yeah, I wouldn't imagine. I think it would matter a little bit, just because it would be harder. Like you know, with a, if you're dating a boy, it's like quite easy. Yeah, I've I've been involved in it. Uh, I, I imagine you know pain, first, firsthand experience. Painfully, it's, it's, it's like you have all you need to make the thing happen. You know what I mean. Right. Whereas if you're dating, it's two girls. There's just a question of like, where do you get the sperm, and how do you get it, and what? Like, there's just it just becomes. It has to be so much more of a des, a decision. Um. So I I mean I don't I think in the grand scheme of things it wouldn't make a difference. But can I can I share something with you? Yes. There's an episode that's going to come out soon that will, in hindsight, to listening to this, be months and months before anybody hears yours, um, where a person talking about in vitro says back, she said back when sperm was cheap. She said it, <laughs> she said it like it was like, I don't know, like it just a, a, it was just, like it was a normal sentence that people spoke all the time. It cracked that, me up. It, I, it sounds like like an apocalypse situation where it's like sperm is the currency or something oh, like that. Back when That's sperm a weird was cheap. Sentence. Yeah, I'm dying. To, like, I'm actually, I want to make it the title of the episode, but I think it's possible no one will listen to it. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but it's just, it, it enthralled me when she said it. And we were not having a particularly like uplifting conversation, but it was just, it was just kind of hilarious. Um, anyway. Uh, back when sperm was cheap, there's no way that's going to be the title of the episode, but it, it damn well should be. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I take your point though. And so, but you don't have a real preference, right? Do you? Um, not really. I think at this point, it's probably women, but it's like it's shifted ta- gotcha. many times. I hear you. Um, well, are your parents alive? They are. Yeah. Okay. Are they very involved in your diabetes? No. You know what? I say that. I take that back. They are really, really involved in um, emotionally supporting me around diabetes. Like they have listened to me talk about it so, so much. And retrospectively, I'm like way too much. Like that must have been so annoying to listen to me talk about it so much. Um, But in terms of the management, they're really not involved. Okay. Um. You think that's because you just didn't grow up in the house with it, but so you're seeing from them like a desire to be involved, but no real way because you don't live with them. Yeah. Okay. Do they yeah. follow what you tell them? Do you think? Do they remember it? Like. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, they definitely do, and they'll, my mom will be like, "What's your insulin to carb ratio now?" Sometimes I'm like, "That's nice, mom." Um, the only thing. Yeah, they generally do. The only thing they have trouble with is 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 pre bolus times. Like I'll go to their house for dinner and it, you know, they'll tell me it's ready in 15 minutes. And I'm like, I have there, I cannot trust you. There's no way it will be ready. And I have no idea what time it will actually be ready, but it will not be 15 minutes. Um, but other than that, they're like, they definitely know what's, they couldn't manage it for me. Right. Um, definitely not, but they do retain what I'm saying. Gotcha. Okay. Well, that's nice. Does that feel good knowing that they're trying to be involved? Yeah, it, they are definitely. Yeah, it feels really nice. It's like they're very, very supportive in in all the ways. The only thing that it 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 would be like I know that I'm the only person who knows how to manage my diabetes, mm-hmm. um, which isn't 
it's a, it would be like, it would be nice. It'd be reassuring to know that somebody else knew what to do. Yeah. Well, who, who could that person be for you if you're not in a, in a steady relationship? Do you think? I don't know. Mm. I, I yeah, don't either. I don't. Like I'm thinking about it. I, I'm, I was just trying to put myself in your position because, you know, if you're not with somebody like that's like, I guess, living with you basically, yeah. then how would they be able to see it enough to understand it? You couldn't explain yeah. it, you know? So is that, a yeah. con- is that a concern for you that in the end you're, you kind of feel by yourself? I think a little, it, it has been, especially, um, especially since like the first year that I had diabetes for a good chunk of it, I was working with, I was doing shows with this friend of mine who has type one. And so that was awesome because you just, he could just be like, he he just helped me so, so much. Mm -hmm. Um, and there was someone there to just, um, who knew what to do. Like I felt, you just feel safer with people who really understand what, what to do. Um, and then when I came back to Toronto and was with my friends who are here, they don't know anything about diabetes and, um, and also hadn't lived with me for the first year. So they hadn't like been around me as someone with diabetes before. And so that was tricky. I felt more alone in that situation. Cause I think they also, they just didn't, it's, it, you know, it's complicated and, as a, they just didn't really understand like that there were things that a year in I didn't at all know what to do or like how to do mm-hmm. um, because I think they were just like, well, you've got it figured out now and it's fine. And it's all just not a thing. That's not really how it works. And it's just so hard to explain to anyone who doesn't have to like really explain. Yeah. So you basically left them as a person who didn't have type one and reappeared in their life as a person with diabetes. Yes. And that's awkward, I imagine. Yeah. Did people handle it okay? I think so. I'm, I don't know. It was hard. It was just like, they just, they were so supportive and lovely for the most part, my close friends. Mm-hmm. But it's just a reality of really, like, they just really didn't understand what would be a problem and what would not. Right. Yeah, there's no like, way to. And how would you ever know? And I didn't. I didn't express it because I was kind of too caught up in the problem. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. I was like, oh my God, how am I going to, this is a problem rather than being like, Hey, it would be helpful. Like we, we had a, like a Halloween gathering um, last year. And at the time I was kind of coming out of the honeymoon period. So my blood sugars were really all over the place and it was really stressful. And my best friend cooked us a meal and we were having gnocchi, but she took, it took longer than she wanted it to. And so we ate gnocchi at like midnight. And I was like, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. <laughs> um, but I, but how was she to know? Like she doesn't, she didn't know that that would be a problem. And I didn't say anything, but it was, a, it was really, really ch- like, I just, it was so stressful and so unpleasant. And it felt like she was kind of doing something. Like, it's so easy to be like, you're doing this on, like, you are doing this to me. You are creating this scenario where I'm going to be up really late dealing with this blood sugar. But she didn't know how to do that. And I didn't say anything. Do you think, um, do you think you, were you reasonable, like, in your mind? Or were you pissed at the time? Like, unreasonably? Oh, I was totally pissed. Okay. Jeez, you might have renamed the episode Noki at Midnight. (laughs) It's a shame. Really? Because I was really falling in love with the other one title. <laughs> but you didn't even do it that long, I don't think. So the whole butt shaking thing, I don't even think. Yeah, it was only part of your life. In the grand scheme of my life. what to do. So you have this like, do you think you, well, don't don't think. Were you low? Were you like hungry? Were you like leading up to this meal? I was hungry. I wasn't low. Okay. And it felt like an affront, like this this whole process is messing with what I need to do, even though they had no way of knowing that. Yes. That's and there's also the thing of, you know, I just wanted to have a nice time was the other thing. Mm-hmm. I like I didn't want to have to. It would have it would have been a lot easier 
to have said to them, Hey, I, can we eat this? Not at midnight. This would be a lot easier for me. Or even to just be like, you should eat this at midnight. This will be wonderful for you. I will have a really small amount and I'll have a dinner, a different dinner earlier. Yeah. Um, but I, it, it, yeah, it was really like the first in the first bit of time of being back with my friends while still having diabetes. And I just didn't really want to have to ask for any accommodations. Like yeah. I just wanted to just do whatever everyone else was doing and and not have to think about it. Mm-hmm. And then, but then when you do that, you have to deal with the consequences of that. Right. Which are there's forces around you that you're not in control of that don't know that you could really benefit from having dinner a little sooner or something to that yeah. effect. Yeah. I, I think that's an interesting look into a, a part of having diabetes that I don't, I don't imagine most people would even consider, you know, when you, when you stop and see the big picture, but that there's this whole dialogue going on in your head between you and your, you know, just in your, to yourself about how you're being, you know, put out and how this is going to be more difficult. You don't want to have to mention it to people, but really you should, you might've been mad at yourself for not saying it, something, you know, very possibly. So there's, yeah. There's a lot going. And how often do you think there are little plays in your head like this that are um, unseen by other people? Like, how often do you think diabetes creates those scenarios? Um, Or is it getting better as you're with it longer? It's definitely getting better. Um, It's I mean, part of the reason it's getting better is just that there's less. I I know what to do more. Um. So there's less thinking about it required. Like it's easier to just be able to be like, okay, this is what, this is what we're eating. This is what I'm going to do. And I don't have to debate it or wonder about it for as long. So midnight dinner, not as big of a deal today as it might've been three years ago. Yeah. Because I would, I would be like, okay, I would know kind of the options of what, like I would know my options for this outcome. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like I would be like, okay, I eat dinner at midnight. Maybe I have to stay up late. Maybe it's worth it. If it's not worth it, I'll eat dinner earlier. Yeah. Um, whereas at the time it just felt like, oh, this thing is happening to me and I don't want it to happen. I wish it wasn't happening, but I, I don't feel like I can really do anything to stop it happening this way. So now I'm just going to deal with the outcome of it, which is, and then not really tell anyone that I'm dealing with the outcome of it because I just want everyone to have a nice time yeah. and not know that the, that's happening. The bigger picture, I'm actually fascinated by this. Like bigger picture, I think it's really interesting that there can be so many, di- you know, just dialogues in your head about things around diabetes that other people would never wonder about. Like, I mean, I guess you could be sitting at a table at a restaurant, you're MDI, right? And you might be yeah. thinking like, do I inject myself here in front of these people? Do I excuse myself and go somewhere? Like, when do I do it? Do I tell them what I'm going to do? Like, I guess that stuff is, is very real. Yeah. It's interesting or not interesting, but I imagine it would be different for everybody, but the, the, there are certain things that I don't think twice about, like the injecting myself in public. I'm not concerned at all about, Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not concerned about whether to tell people about it. I'm very okay with people seeing all of that. It's more of the timing and amount and and stuff around um, around meals. Yeah. Like the okay, if I give myself this now, like what's better? Is it better to dose now, as soon as I order my food, and then be a little bit stressed the whole time that the food's going to be not there within my sort of pre bolus time, or is it better? to dose when the food hits the table and wait 15 minutes and have it be cold. Like which would the, which scenario would I prefer here? Right. Yeah. That sucks. Can we switch gears for a second? Yeah, sure. Does dating women make you aware of yourself more when you're dating men? Whoa, that's a great question. I know. I mean, thank you. <laughs> um, It definitely makes you aware Oh, I'm going to sound like such a millennial, but it makes you more aware of the gender roles in the situation. How? Just like when I'm dating men, um, there's cert- it, it just sort of, it's, cl- I don't know, it's clearer. It's more straightforward to go on a date with a man. 
I don't know if that would still be the, the be the case, but there is just an element of like, this is how I engage with men. And it feels very easy. And I'm like, I know how to be on a date with a man. Mm-hmm. I've been like conditioned into me since I was a child from watching like movies where women go on dates with men. But then with women, I found it because I started dating women later and like in my sort of mid to late twenties. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, I found it, it less so now, but I found it harder to get to know kind of how to behave. Um, I also have a lot of friends who are women who I go out for drinks with. So I was like, am I just out with my friend? No, I'm not. Am I attracted to this person or do I just like having a nice chat with them? Like, do I like them as a friend? Do I like them as a romantic partner? Yeah. It just felt a lot like there was fewer um there was like no limits to what could happen and therefore it was confusing. Do you ever see a behavior or an attribute in a woman that you're dating and think to yourself I don't like that and I recognize that I have that attribute? Oh yeah, for sure. Interesting. And then does that change anything or you just like cuz it's hard to change who you are. Like you know what I mean? Like it's not like you but but it would just seem to me that it would be easier to mirror because I'm, I'm imagining that I'm irritating in a thousand different ways, right? But when I look at my wife, she's, you know, she's irritating in different ways. <laughs> um, so I never see myself in her, really. But mm-hmm. I, w- I just found myself wondering, like, what if I saw myself in my wife? Like, would I be like, oh, God, I do that, too? Um, you know what I mean? More frequently, at least. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I totally, this is funny because maybe I'll tell her not to listen to this, but I, um, have been dating somebody, um, who we look a lot alike, which is really weird. And she is somebody who I notice things in her that I'm like, Ooh, that's something that I notice. That is something that I notice in myself and that's a negative quality. And I totally do try and try and change it. Well, I don't think that's necessarily because she's a woman. I think it might just be because, but also we look a lot alike. So maybe it is, I don't know. <laughs> maybe, 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 maybe it hit you deeper because you almost see yourself. That's interesting. Yeah. Whoa. All right. I'm not going to ask any weird questions about how close you look alike and whether or not <laughs> it feels like, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. We're not going to talk about that. Um, like it doesn't feel like being with yourself, right? No. Okay. All right. No, not at all. Okay. That's all. Do you think right? No, never mind. <laughs> you can ask. No, I mean, I can ask, but I want everybody to be able to listen. <laughs> so <laughs> it's got to stop somewhere, you know. Uh, Margaret, I have, a, you know, this is not the first time that I, I've interviewed somebody who's, uh, you would consider yourself bisexual, I guess. Yeah, I like pansexual, probably. Okay. Got. Will you define those for me so I understand? I 100%. Um, bisexual is you're attracted to both women and men. Mm -hmm. Pansexual is you're attracted to people regardless of gender. It's like kind of a a limited distinction, but it's like, or not limited. It's like, it's not, it's a pretty subtle distinction. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Would that cover like if I was, um, if I was a transgendered man, Yeah, that would cover that. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. I understand. I'm old. So (laughs) In my mind, there's, you know, there's less distinctions. So not that I don't understand that there are. It's just that when I think about them, they don't pop into my head that way. 100%. You understand. Um, It's so funny. There's an episode of the podcast that was recorded. It's one of the ones no one's ever heard. So um, if you've ever heard me talk about it before, I did one with a a girl who um, asked me later not to air it because her and her partner were traveling abroad and they were literally afraid they'd be, um, they'd be identified. I think she was giving the podcast a little too much credit, but she, that they'd be identified. Her partner was concerned because her partner, I don't, I'm not being, I'm not being lighthearted, but I remember words like Zim and things like that. But this was like a long time ago, like Uh years and years before, like, anybody was trying to understand gender like in in um in the world that i existed in i guess and so i she explained the whole thing to me my mind was fried at the time yeah. but i really do wish i could air it because it's a person like trying to understand it just new ideas 
You know, you know what I mean? It was, yeah. it was, I, I had such a hard time tracking it back then. I think I would have an easier time now, but, um, anyway, no one's ever going to hear it because they were, they were scared that they, um, would, would, um, there'd be some sort of retribution if people knew who they were. Um, but anyway, I, I was lost in the conversation. She was explaining it and I'm just like, I could not follow. And it was just, I don't know. Anyway, I, I yeah. probably would be embarrassed by it if I heard it. Nevertheless. But it is like, I don't know, I found it, it's still confusing sometimes because it's like things that you have known, you have known or been taught or whatever for your whole life. And someone's trying to explain something to you that like kind of fundamentally shifts that. And that is, it's like hard for your brain to do. Yeah. I, it's the, it's like the pronoun thing. Like my, I, I don't not want to do it, but it's, it doesn't happen all the time. You, you yeah. know what I mean? So, yeah. um, I don't know. It's just a weird, it's a weird situation to be in. And the older you are too, the less agile your brain is. Like there's just, seriously, there's no way around that. You know, some things are just like fried into your mind at that point. You can like hear it and then go, oh, I didn't mean that. Um, but it's, you know, that's it. It's just, it's a very, yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting situation to be in. And things uh, morph much more quickly now. And we're all aware of each other because of social media and the internet and everything before as the world morphed, a 45 year old, 50 year old person didn't, they weren't even aware of it. Like they would, yeah. never, they would never know. You know what I mean? I'd be like, Oh, there's some kids living in Toronto. They do that thing. You, you know what I mean? But I'm over yeah. here and I don't know about it. And anyway, eh, it's interesting. All right. Which is better boys or girls? That's my last question. Which is oh easier, God. easier, which is easier. Boys are easier. Boys are easier than girls. Yeah. Can I say something? Yeah. I assume that. <laughs> because of my experiences with girls <laughs> um but um easier like just less dramatic no, no um just just more straightforward it's just like I had a bit of a hard time knowing that I was um not straight like it took me a bit to figure it out mm -hmm. and so there's just some like being like you know I I was in like the high school that I went to, there was like, it was at the time when you were like, you're so gay is like the worst insult you can say to somebody. Mm -hmm. So there was, there's still some just like, not so much anymore, but for a long time there was some like, okay, it's okay that you are gay. Like that took a lot. There was a lot of like figuring that out and it was all sort of tied up with dating women. So it was just way more complicated. Right. And also the women that I would, were, were was dating or kind of also doing to some degree, not all of them, but also doing that same thing. And oh, there's the oh. like figuring out so just how to do it. It was just more complicated. So this, there at times can be two people who are in that same state of figuring themselves out. Totally. Whereas when you're with a guy who's straight, he knows he's straight and that's not up for debate. Yeah. Okay. okay. And it's also like, you know, your parents, dated and got married their parents dated and got married there's just so many examples of how to do it mm -hmm. so it's just very easy to, to be like okay i'm going on a date with a man and now we go out again it's i mean it sounds kind of stupid i'm like it's not that complicated to go on dates but it is more straightforward with guys than it is with girls for yeah. sure yeah. or i found that anyway well i i have a ton of like compassion for dating in a digital age like i think it it can't possibly be easy yeah, you know, I'm not very good at it. I will say that. Well, listen, you're 30 years old and you're still using Margaret. Like people don't call you Maggie or anything like that, right? They they do. It's just none of it's ever stuck. It, but it's funny. So I while we were talking, I made it my mission to find a photo of you, which I've done. And oh, you don't know if it's me though. It might not be me. There's lots of Margaret. I was gonna say my last name. There's lots of Margaret Thompsons in the world. Well, I don't you, mind. Well, you did say your last name. Yeah, it's fine. We, well, first of all, Margaret, I know I found you because you're in my Facebook group. Oh, oh yeah, I am in your Facebook group. Yeah, so I was able to find you. And you, you know, I was trying to find out what a Margaret looked like <laughs> at 30. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Because in my mind, Margaret's like, it's a, it's a, it's like a more proper older name. Yeah, it's like an 80 year old lady name. <laughs> but you're adorable. Like you're just a little like. You're, you're, you're like a, you're, you're a nice looking like younger person. I'm old. I don't <laughs> oh, know how you. to like, I can't interact with you because it'll feel creepy, but you're cute. So, um, and, and do you not look like a Margaret? 
that became my question that I had to ask myself. And then I realized you do now look like a Margaret because I know you. Yes. Right. No, I mean, for an hour. Yeah. I know you for an hour. Um, but I can totally see that being your name. That's all. <laughs> Catholic? Um, no, like United Church. Oh, you don't sound very religious. I don't know. <laughs> we went to, we we went to church growing up like my mom we would take us to church but my dad's an atheist so he would stay home. Um and it was nice like I liked the singing. I liked the part where the guy would sort of talk about ideas but mm-hmm. um it didn't stay. I don't know about I don't know about church. Do your parents know you're pansexual? Yeah. And what was that like? Did they were like did one of them go yeah yeah we know or was it like oh okay or how did it go? Um, it's funny. I retrospectively, my, I probably should have made it a bit of a bigger deal. Um, but yeah, my parents are just very lovely. Like they're very supportive. We have a very nice relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of, and I had sort of started dating women and I was like, I feel weird that I haven't said anything to them, but I don't really think it will matter. So I think I just told my mom that I was going on a date with a girl and she was like, Oh, that's interesting. And that was kind of the extent of the conversation. Oh, nice. And then she disseminated yeah. that information to your father. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't you have loved to have been there when she's like, sit down. I have to tell you something like, this is such a big deal. <laughs> I would die to know how she put it to him. <laughs> yeah, it was probably so nicely and properly phrased. It would. Yeah. Or just the complete opposite, and it would have shocked the hell out of you. <laughs> like, I'm probably going to bleep this out, but, like, can you imagine your mom sitting your father down and going, Margaret's a c***er. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish that's what she said. That is awesome. <laughs> or something ridiculous, you know what I mean? It's something and, horrible, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> just, and then your dad just goes, eh, all right. <laughs> oh, my God. That wow! Uh, I don't know. I'm sorry. I, I imagine it was probably dainty, and she was probably like, "I need to tell you something." And uh, I was talking to Margaret. No, <laughs> make I'm that is I'm that. What you just said is erasing whatever I thought would happen, and that's forever. What my my visual of that experience is going to be. Just let oh, it be God. that in your mind. It'll be more fun that way. Oh, it's way more fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your parents could be people you don't even realize. How many siblings do you have, or none? I have two brothers. Two brothers. Are they older than you? They're both younger. Younger. Okay. Any of them living with your parents still? No. Hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I don't know. Your parents could be having a wild time over there. I don't know. I mean, think I mean, about your grandfather. Of, they watch a lot of, like, art lectures and um, British naked, cop maybe. shows. Maybe naked they're watching them. Oh, my God, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's happening. You don't either. I'm just saying. No, I don't. I, that's the problem. <laughs> Like, I don't know that that's not happening. <laughs> I, I'm not going to be happy till this podcast ends with you imagining your mother with a riding crop. That's all. Oh, <laughs> my God. All right. Well, this has gone off the rails, Margaret. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you wanted to? <laughs> I mean, we didn't talk at all about, like, diabetes and musical theater. No. Okay. Well, go ahead. <laughs> but I'm like, now I don't even really know what I would want to talk about. I think that's my charm, honestly, Margaret, if I'm saying. Um one of my secrets is that, you know, I think that when people think about their diabetes and talking about it, they come up with these very concrete, like, narratives. They're like, well, I am in musical theater and I have diabetes and that's interesting. But I think that the interesting stuff about people is the stuff they don't even ever think about. So, like, if we kept talking, if you told me right now we only have 10 more minutes to talk, Scott, I'd want to know about managing your type 1 during like intimate situations. Um, I'd want to know more about what you hide from other people, what you hide from yourself, what you wish you could just talk about out loud and why you're holding yourself back. Um, but most people, when they think about coming on the podcast, they're like, well, I'll talk about the fact that I dance and I have blood sugars and they get low sometimes, but everyone knows that already. You, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I just think about it differently, but anyway, I'll talk about whatever you want. What do you want to say? No, I'm like, well, I don't really need to talk about that because that's kind of it. Yeah. I mean, you listen to the podcast, right? Just it's exercise and set temp yeah. basils. And if you are uh, MDI, maybe, you know, there's certain things you can eat to help hold your blood sugar up while you're dancing. And I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's it. That really is it. Right. That stuff's like, 
I don't know. Like that's that's in the pro tip episodes. Go get it. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. You don't need you don't need Margaret to explain how she gets through dancing. <laughs> no, and I'm like medium at it at best. So don't listen to me. Go listen to the pro tips. I like at this point you've described your diabetes management as mediocre, I think, and medium. Yeah. <laughs> but do you think if you had a pump, it would be different? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, I also like I think my diabetes management is is good it's just not um it's still work in progress you know what, what do you what do you consider good like what's your a1c your last one this is six a uh, six is great yeah and it's been the six is like it's been in the fives basically since i was diagnosed and i've been trying to like get a little bit more wild with my food choices so mm-hmm. it went up a little bit and you're out of your honeymoon now you think yeah i'm and, pretty sure and you held a six i think that's terrific yeah, I'm, I'm like, I'm totally happy with it, yeah. I think. Are you trying to get back to I pizza think. and ice cream so you can go find that nurse? Oh, yeah. I can be like, listen, lady, my I... A1C is amazing and I'm eating all the pizza I want. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I eat whatever I want. I got a six. You were wrong. Nah. Your boyfriend. What, what was it? She dated a guy that did he died? Yeah, he was. He had a heart attack and he had diabetes. It's really yeah. awful, actually. Like, yeah. that's terrible. I, that's it's really any healthcare worker who thinks that that's a good way to approach a newly diagnosed person is off their rocker. That's just ridiculous. Although in every walk of life, people say things that I'm stunned by all the time. You know, it's yeah. just it's it's hard to think and communicate. People aren't great at it. Uh, but what are you going to do? You're going to live. You're going to work in that bakery until they open things back up. You're going to get back to doing what you love doing. And then you're going to get on with yourself. Yeah. yeah. What kind of, uh, do you do bake in the bakery or do you sell in the bakery? We sell in the bakery. Do you guys make the stuff there or do you buy it and just repurpose it? Um, Some of it we s- <laughs> repurpose it. You know what um, I mean? No, I do, but it's <laughs> funny. Um, so we bake like the cookies there. Um, the rest of the stuff comes from kind of a central bakery where they're very good at baking. We just kind of scoop cookies out and bake them on a tray. I took baking for three years in high school. Oh my God. Are you a good baker? I am. It's a, a skill I don't get to use very often, but here's what happened. I hated school, like with a burning passion. I did not like being in school and we were leaving middle school, which is probably not what you call it, but it was like my eighth year of school, eighth, ninth year of school, depending, I guess, if you count kindergarten and getting up to high school, which I don't know what they call that in Canada. Uh, but there were, um, it was the opportunity to go to, you know, like uh, there was like an industrial school where you could learn a trade. I guess they would call that trade school. And um, I had no interest in it. We were in a, um, you know, like in an auditorium being told about all of our possibilities for high school. And I was not paying attention. And this person explained the schedule for trade school. And the schedule was this two weeks of high school solid, then two solid weeks at trade school, then two weeks of high school, then two solid weeks of trade school. And I quickly did that math and thought, well, if high school is three years long and I go to trade school, high school is now only a year and a half long and it's broken up in two week increments. And that seemed very doable to me. So I went to the, you know, know, they walked us around the trade school and you could go through every class and see which every class was. So you're like in small engine repair, There was hair care. There was like, you know, there were all these different things. And at the end of the day, I just chose where the most girls were and took that. Oh, my God. It is a good strategy. But it's the only thing I had. So, I mean, because I didn't care. I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't want to go to trade school. I wanted to not go to high school for three solid years or to, you know, so I just, I literally just, I I got home. I had the form in my hand. And I thought there were a lot of attractive girls in the bakery. And I uh, honestly, I made the decision probably the same way you would, Margaret. And I, <laughs> and, and I, um, and I, and I, and I, and I, my mom's like, you care about that? I'm like, I'm a pretty decent cook. It'll be okay. And then I learned how to bake over the next three years, but at like large scale, like not a cinnamon bun, but thousands of cinnamon buns and not a loaf of bread but hundreds of pounds of loaves of bread and i learned how to bake on a large scale that's very cool it's like probably the best decision you could have made because you have an actual skill that you're going to use 
and you got to chat to lots of ladies. Like that sounds great. I made a absolutely crazy good pound cake the other day. So <laughs> it was, it's really good. Like it's, it's one of those cakes that sits in the house and people pick at it until it gets stale. And then we just shove it in the trash. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. yeah, I do have that skill and the girls were fun. So, and by fun, I mean fun in the most inappropriate way. Um, <laughs> and, and so uh, it was a good time. I got suspended once for being in the ladies bathroom. Oh my God. Other than that, it went okay. Yeah, it was fine, Margaret. It's a different right. world. You know what I mean? You don't know. I mean, no, younger. I don't. I yeah. don't know. <laughs> you really don't know. Um, yeah, it was uh, personal relationships were measured differently in the 80s. <laughs> there were, there were, uh, I'll tell you about it when we're done recording. Anyway, okay. do you have anything else or are you good? No, I think I'm good. I, I, I totally understand because I, you know, I listen to the podcast. And I totally understand why people are like, I don't even know what we talked about afterwards. I'm like, I don't, I don't know at all what we talked about. Yeah. No, you're in my mind. It's moving slightly faster than it should be. So it's, uh, it's good times. Um, how long have you been listening to the show? Um, a while. Like, I think I started listening maybe a month or two after I was diagnosed. Oh, wow. And um, how'd you find it? Oh, I joined like a type 1 diabetes athlete Facebook group like shortly after being diagnosed and uh, just for like management tips. Right. And um, someone had posted, I, I actually remember this so clearly, some woman, uh, there's a woman who was managing her granddaughter and she was like, what I do when I want to have a cupcake is I watch the Dexcom line and I wait to see when it dips and then I have the cupcake. And I was like, that is so cool. And then in that same comment post, they're like, you want more, like, it wasn't like this, but it was kind of like, you want more tips like this, check out the juice box podcast. And I was like, great, I'll, I'll check out the juice box podcast. And then, yeah, I, I, uh, I had a 20 minute walk to work at the time. So I just listened to it whenever I was walking to work. And I captured your imagination and here you are. Here I am. Yeah. Well, thank you to all the people who so unabashedly pimp the podcast for me. I really appreciate that. Thank you. You found Margaret and now Margaret's (laughs) here and think who you'll find next. A year from now, we could be having another scintillating conversation with someone who was found the exact same way. Listen to me. I'm marketing now for myself. (laughs) All right. I'm going to let you go. But hold on a second. And I'll tell you how we interacted as children in the 80s. Okay? Yeah. All right. Huge thanks to Margaret for coming on the show and sharing her story. And thanks to Dexcom and the Dexcom G6. Head to Dexcom.com forward slash juice box to get started. I'd also like to thank Omnipod and remind you that the Omnipod 5 and the Omnipod Dash can be gotten, gotten, getting, going at the Omnipod.com forward slash juice box. Links in the show notes. Links at juiceboxpodcast.com to these and all of the sponsors. When you click the links, you're helping the show. So please do that. I'm also going to include a complete non sequitur from the beginning of the podcast that got edited out. I don't know why. I just enjoyed it. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back very soon with another episode of the Juice Box Podcast. I mean, I could eat another piece of toast. Can you imagine if we reenacted it and then later told people it was a reenactment of you eating toast? <laughs> You're like, just so you know, Matt. Oh my, oh my God. I'll tell you, in my mind, that would be the equally the most boring and enthralling five minutes that a podcast ever opened. Right now, you're listening to Margaret eat toast. Oh, my God. <laughs> and then tell the story about the bolus and then say, now, we weren't recording when this happened originally. So this is a reenactment. And in the background, we just hear you going like, just like, like just eating like daintily. You know, I think oh it'd be hilarious. God. I don't know. Well, oh, I hate listening to people chew. So that would probably be my, like I would that would be my worst nightmare, I think, is that would be like the intro to the episode. No, so I would I would turn this episode off. So that's great. Oh, my God. That's hilarious. Arden's texting me right now. Um, can you make me waffles when I get home? And I'm saying yes.